Where is Vanessa? Hey guys, what's up? Aru. Now, this question has been on my mind as we inch over closer to Natlan, but instead of just asking where is Vanessa, it's a bit more like where's Vanessa and her tribe? I mean, who exactly are these people and why are they so important in Genshin's lore? Vanessa is a figure that you've likely seen in the earliest game's teasers, and she plays a key role in some of the oldest iterations of Genshin Impact's lore. She's not just any character either. Vanessa is a cornerstone of the game's history and was arguably one of the first characters showcased before the game's release. Well, not exactly the first, but you get what I mean. And her tribe could likely be one of the oldest and probably the first people of Natland that we now don't even see in the teaser. So in this video, we'll dive into everything we know about Vanessa, exploring the intriguing details surrounding her and her tribe, and how they might connect to Natland's lore in 5.0. But before we jump in, I recommend reading the first chapter of the Genshin manga, or the prologue, or watching a summary of her lore as I won't be covering the manga storyline, but rather the lore and theories related to Natlan. So without further ado, let's get started. Starting off, did you know that Vanessa's name is actually spelled Vanessa and not Vanessa? Also, the prologue chapter of the Genshin manga in the CN version was actually removed. This chapter, tied to the upcoming Natlan region, being removed in the CN version might hint at something significant, though it's hard to say exactly what. Now, why would they remove the prologue of an entire series of chapters about Genshin Impact? Well, censorship between CN and global versions, like the reskinning of characters such as Amber, Jean, Rosaria, and Mona is one example. The Genshin manga showcases this, particularly in the depictions of Netland characters and Venti's Archon form. Another possible reason for the removal could be the discrepancies in the manga's translation regarding Netland and Tavat's current lore. If you're familiar with Before the Sun and Moon, you'll know that the songs of the primeval ones don't exactly translate to myths of the primordial one. While we do have a primordial one, we also have primeval ones, which ties into the differences between the manga's depiction of Tevet's creation stories and the one that we know about in-game. Next, the name Murata is a phonetic rendering in Chinese, Munata, which means solemn, acceptance, and tower. But what does this mean for Genshin's lore? I mean, why is this tower so significant, especially in the context of Natlan? Well, this aligns with the Ignition Teaser's theme, to solemnly accept the challenge with the tower as well as the fire of Natlan, representing Natlan's concept of change. Fire is a symbol of transformation, purification, and renewal, which is echoed through the Travail Teaser. Interestingly, the Chinese name Munata also connects to the lost continent of Mu, or Atlantis. In the Nartes and Kreutz Ordo questline, Natlan is also referred to as Natlantian, suggesting that the Natlan people, Muratan, and Natlantian could all be the same. This hints that Natlan might be part of the root cycles, similar to the fallen civilizations like Hyperborea and the most recent Conria, suggesting that Nata and Munata could be the near-peak civilization and might be central to Celestia's future actions, which explains why Natlan teasers appear more advanced and sophisticated than what we initially envisioned as more traditional and less developed. And the closest similarity to Natlantian in Natlan or Munata would be Wakanda from the Avengers series. The narrative also touches on the possible representations of Natlan's people, not just in skin color but also in historical parallels such as the aristocrats of Mondstadt buying slaves inspired by European colonization around 500 years ago in real life. Now, although the prologue chapter is removed in CN, it remains in the global version at least, possibly due to the specific reasons tied more to CN compared to global sensitivities. Quick disclaimer, I'm not fluid in the Chinese language, so this is my interpretation and might not be entirely accurate. But I think it's worth considering since Natlan is literally just two weeks away. Now, Murata in the English manga refers to the Chinese name Munata, meaning Natlan and its people. And in more literal and phonetic translations, it was meant more as a place rather than a person. Interestingly, Venti still refers to the Pyro Archon as Lady of Fire, but she might not be the current Pyro Archon today. Since Zhongli and Venti are the only original Archons still alive, it's possible that the Lady of Fire, who once held the title of the Pyro Archon, has passed away, and what we now know as the Archon of War is possibly now called Mavuika. Going back, the name Murata in its CN phonetic translation roughly means solemnly to accept 
tower, which has similar ties to the word Natlantian and the concept of Atlantis. The translation aligns with Natland ceremonial rites and acceptance of fire, life, death, and rebirth, as well as transition and change. Historically, these towers often precede the fall of kingdoms like Gurabad, Remuria, Conria, the Caribbean, and possibly Hyperborea. But what about Natlan and its solemn tower of acceptance, which we've likely seen in the Ignition teaser? Perhaps Natlan or Munata or Natlantian, whether the old or new name, is the current cycle's most advanced civilization, a root cycle, and holds the true knowledge of the past and knows how to forge their own future after years of studying bygone eras. Think of the Nartes and Kreuzordo but ranked up all the way to 11. And the mention of eyes could also hint at this, referring to their true eyes and not the god-given ones from Celestia. A concept and worldview that the Hexen Circle member Nicole has been hinting towards us since we've been in Sumeru. Vanessa and her tribe, referred to as the Flame Touch Muratans or Natlantians, are known for their striking bright red hair and very rambunctious and short-tempered personalities. Interestingly, no character with bright red hair is seen in the Ignition teaser. The closest is Chaska, but her dark clothing contrasts with the white monk-like robes worn by Vanessa's tribe. We also don't know if Vanessa's tribe of Natlantians originated from the six tribes of modern-day Natlan or from an older, possibly unified tribe. But it's likely that a fallen kingdom event or a bygone era has led to the old Natlantians out of their region leaving those who remain to form a new kingdom in modern-day Natland. And a tower would have likely been constructed in the same concept, leading to the fall of these bygone eras again, quite similar to Fontaine and Remoria's transition. We also have no idea if anyone from Vanessa's tribe has ever returned, or if they ever will return. Since we've only seen the teasers and I avoid leaks, this is as far as we can speculate about the flame-touched tribe of Natlandians. Moving on, Vanessa is an anomaly in Genshin's lore and an enigma in both Natlan's and Mondstadt's history. He rose from being a helpless but strong slave to ascending to Celestia and becoming the Falcon of the West. Based on the prologue chapter, it's unclear if she became a god or received a vision before ascending to Celestia. With what we know about becoming Xian or transcendental, Vanessa might not have become a god but she still transcended her mortal form. And even after a thousand years after her likely death, she became an immortal guardian or pseudo-archon god that watches over Mondstadt even in Venti's absence. The Four Winds. This ties back to Tavat's concept of visions as binding contracts with the gods, where fulfilling your duty results in a greater reward for the gods. The Gnostic soul's ascension of birds escaping the material world also seemed to apply to Vanessa, and a symbolism of Sophia, the great knowledge, or Siziki, the wife of Christ in Gnostic mythology which interestingly ties with Mavuika as the wife of Awahuitoria. Now it's worth mentioning that Vanessa has a younger sister, Lind or Linda. While all of the flame-touched Muratans or Atlanteans have red hair, it's unclear if they're actually blood-related siblings or if it's a normative respectful term as seen in many languages. Now to me, there's a clear connection between wind and fire that Hoyoverse is developing and it's very intriguing to see where they're going with it. Venti's appearance in the prologue where he speaks of what seems to be Tavat's origin story suggests that he's more than just a storyteller. He might be a world builder in his own right, which again connects to all the God of Time and Easteroth theories that we've seen. Venti and the Pyro Archon seems to share more than just friendship too. His in-game foreshadowing likely extends to the manga as well. I mean, why did Venti wake up at the perfect time and have an outsider from Natlan as a new leader of Mondstadt? His poems are carefully crafted to remain unchanged despite what we know of Ermensoul's history changes or the Loom of Fate and Celestia's prophecies. And the mixed Pyro colors in the Ignition teaser seem to have an Animo influence to it as well. As one of the original Archons and a strand of the Thousand Winds, Venti's role is very crucial. It's as if the winds are helping fire to stay alive. And yet we haven't seen any animal wielder from Natlan. Either Jensen or Ororon might be the candidates, while Capitano is likely Electro, given that we already have the Wanderer. And going back all the way to the Travail teaser, 
When Dane Sniff mentioned that the Pyro Archon would share secrets of war, it likely includes the secret of Natlan's origins, the Natlanteans. The Pyro Archon's inspiration, Mahuika, the fire deity, is a keeper of the secrets of fire and the wife of Oahitoria, the origin of fire. If we consider the tower of fire that Mahuika gestures to, you might also possess knowledge of that same past of solemnly accepting the tower. And that past likely mirrors the fall of other bygone kingdoms brought down by ignorance, greed, ambition, and most of all, arrogation or usurpation. This theme of usurpation is not only seen in the Archons, but also in the tale of the Primordial One, who usurped the rule of the dragons. And a secret to what might have happened is likely hiding behind Mawika as well as what happened with Vanessa and her tribe. So hopefully, and I really do hope that we get some semblance of lore or have Vanessa's tribe be connected to Netland's story. Will we finally learn more about Vanessa's tribe in the upcoming updates or could their story be tied to the future of Netland? We've seen the root cycles before but it's only been mentioned in world quests rather than archon quests. And as much as I love playing every world quest in the game, I really do wish it would be integrated more into the main story. We've gotten hints in some relation from Fontaine and Remoria before, but it wasn't really seen again after 4.2. And as a fan of Vanessa and her tribe, as well as wanting every red-haired character in the game, I really do hope that we get to know more about her tribe of Natlanteans and the old civilization of Natlan. But based on Mavuika and the Ignition teaser, that's probably the way Hoyo plans to move their story towards. Their lore still makes sense and it still applies to current day Natlan. But some translations in the prologue sort of mixed up some of the meanings. Anyway, we'll likely know more about it in a few weeks once the trailer and the actual region releases. So with that said, I'll see you guys in the next video, yeah? Like, comment if you enjoyed, subscribe and hit the bell for more of my ramblings and stay mad theorists. Bye!